Now looking at domestic sewage, this is to treat uh, sewage coming out of cities and treat it before you put it back in the water systems. This is a picture, an aerial photo from a sewage treatment plant in Portland, Oregon. And the goal here is to take the sewage, treat it, release the effluent into the water systems that is uh, clean and free of any um, diseases or, or chemicals that will cause eutrophication or will pollute the water as it gets into the normal water system. The ways we treat them, generally these plants are divided into three pieces and the fourth one on the bottom here is, is it depends on regulation and laws and things. So the preliminary treatment where well, you screen the big pieces out and you can see that uh, over here in the picture. So there's some screening going on to get the big pieces out, to get the sand, the grit out of there. Um, and then we have primary sedimentation tanks and that's where things are left to settle and the sludge is removed off the, bo the bottom of this uh, slurry and then microorganisms will feed on this waste and you need to stir it with water and you can see that taking place in these areas over here it starts to get mixed and mixed and mixed and then eventually once the microorganisms have eaten off all um, the toxins that we have in there and eventually uh, that will move on to the to the last level and different treatment plants have different tertiary treatments. Uh, here's a tertiary treatment uh, over here. So effluent disinfection. You can have disinfection um, from for pathogens, for example. You can have removal of chemicals if there's high nitrate or phosphate content in that water because you don't want those nitrates and those phosphates moving into the water system down here because that will cause something called eutrophication later. Nitrates and phosphates are what plants love to consume. And if you dump extra nitrates and phosphates into the water, if you recall from eutrophication, then uh, the plants will bloom really quickly. Algae will bloom, it'll die sinks to the bottom and all that decomposition will eventually use up all the oxygen in the water, kill whatever's in that water, fish, everything else, and it'll basically kill that ecosystem. One thing to think about with industrial discharge for our course, for ESS, is the, the bigger picture, the more of the political side of this. So some political groups might come in and say, hey, that's too expensive, um, let's not use them. These environmental laws are, are overblown. Uh, while well, other political groups might come in and say, we're not doing enough for our environment at all. Uh, so let's set up a lot more tertiary treatments to really clean that water before it goes into the environment. Now, moving along, when we're talking about uh, agricultural runoff, we're talking about things coming from farms, essentially, big farms, small farms. And there's four types of agricultural runoff that we're going to focus on as I speed through this list. Um, Pesticides, and those are used sprays that are used to kill pests, bugs, essentially, that are eating the crops. Um, and a lot of farmers use pesticides to maintain a healthy crop. Fertilizers are things that are sprayed on the land to actually fertilize generally the soil. And those crops, the plants will suck in those fertilizers to grow nice and big and strong. Those usually involve NPK fertilizers, nitrogen um, phosphorus and potassium, essential ingredients to make plants big, strong, healthy, and their fruit as well. Um, organic waste also has a lot of these natural fertilizers in it as well, like cow manure. Um, and also then we'll look at runoff. So how these things, when it rains, how all this stuff goes out of the system back into the rivers and lakes and streams and oceans. So looking at pesticides first, and like I said, here's the list, one, two, three, four. So here's number one, pesticides. Um, we'll look at how these things can be reduced because we're trying to fix this problem now. If we can really reduce pesticides, if we have things like ladybugs, and you can buy ladybugs online, you can get a big bag of ladybugs delivered to you this week if you had things like aphids, which I do. I'm actually growing tomatoes right now, and I have a lot of these little black things, uh, which are called aphids. And I saw a ladybug in my, in I call it a garden, it's a balcony with some tomato plants. Um, and I saw a ladybug land on one and I was just ecstatic. That's fantastic because this ladybug is a natural pest control. It'll kill up all the aphids, it gets fat and healthy and goes has more ladybugs. My tomato plants are protected. No chemical is used, perfect. Um, if you need to use uh, pesticides, sprays, 
they say use them when when they're needed when you have the pest don't just spray all the time um, and you can use target specific sprays there's some sprays that really go after aphids only versus there's generalized sprays and if i use a generalized spray guess what i'm going to kill the ladybug as well so i'll actually dampen that um that environment that ecosystem as a whole so there are ways to use pesticides wisely in this system fertilizers uh things you're adding to the soil to make your plants nice and big and healthy there are replacements for nitrate based fertilizers uh like ammonium based fertilizers and why would you replace it? Because those nitrates, when they run off into the water systems, as we mentioned earlier, will cause that problem of eutrophication. So if we can reduce what we're releasing into the environment in the first place, that's a good thing. And there's alternatives, ammonia-based fertilizers. Um, organic fertilizers are good too, because these are, uh, organic means they're, they're probably um, carbon-based and they are locked in a bigger chain. So when you dump the, the cow manure in a field, that, that is in there. Those nitrates are in there, and they release slowly as this thing breaks down through natural processes. Whereas uh, inorganic, or you take that nitrate just in a synthetic fertilizer and dump it in, it's immediate pump right away, and you get those al algal blooms when it runs off. So you can hammer things much faster, which can be a plus if you're trying to grow faster as well. So there has to be some kind of consideration there, I suppose. Um, another thing, only use them when they're needed. Certain plants at certain times right before they fruit might need a different fertilizer to stimulate the fruit growth rather than the leaf growth. So a little bit more knowledge uh, by the farming industry could, could really help with this. Now, there's a lot of knowledge out there, obviously, um, but applied on the larger scale, maybe through policy as well, forcing people to think about these things more critically for the environment could really help. Obviously, use when they're when it's dry weather. If it's raining, guess what? You run off, and I've seen that many, many times. People spray fields, and it rains the next day. Like someone just forgot to look at the weather map or something, and all that effort that they did just sent all their fertilizer into the river, which is bad for everybody. Uh, organic waste is the third one. Organic waste, just things like cow manure. So farmers collecting up cow manure, turning it into a slurry in this red trailer here, and then spraying that over a field. Um, this can be treated prior to discharge, treated because there can be pathogens inside that you could be spreading across this field as well. And that can be treated pretty easily. Same as before, use it in dry weather. So you don't do it in the rain when it's just gonna run off anyways. And don't do it near rivers. There's methods if you are near a river on how to protect these aquatic systems. And you can see that here by, by having a buffer zone. So don't farm right up until a river, leave a buffer zone so with with there's a lot of different types of plants actually that really suck in those um, NPK fertilizers and can hold them in the plant as well. So you can actually use those as a buffer along. Uh, if you use contours, natural contours or terraces, uh, because then you don't get the stream flowing straight down to the river, you can actually run the water around and you've all seen those rice patties, that's kind of the idea. And the idea of having different crop layers so when the water really hits, it doesn't hammer down on that soil and cause a splash that runs off very quickly. You can have higher and lower crops and the higher crops can protect that splash. The last thing here we'll look at is um, managing the idea of eutrophication. And well, how do you mitigate it? How do we sort of control it before it happens? Um, and then how do we adapt to it when it's happening then? This will be the next slide, adaptation. Um, again, things that we can do to improve the situation is using phosphate-free detergents. Um, remember, NPK, those are the three things plants love. And really, eutrophication is all about the N and the P. So if we can get rid of phosphates, doing a good job. Um, we can, again, we can require tertiary sewage treatment. It's more expensive, uh, and a lot of industries, especially those plants, don't want to spend the money on it. But we can require that by law, or you can provide subsidies to have governments implement that, and you'll have cleaner water going into the environment. Um, again, using fertilizers more efficiently, more effectively, keep livestock that are pooping in or near the water away from that water to keep the nitrogen out of that water, and that will help. So I did a quick Google search for um, 
algal blooms, and this is what came up in for eutrophication and algal blooms. Um, it just goes and goes and goes and goes. And you can see all these images. I'm just scrolling through more and more and more images. It's, it's nonstop. This is a global issue. This is a local issue that's turned global. It's everywhere. And the mechanisms for this is the same in all these different areas around the planet. Now we've seen the example. Let's go back to see how we deal with it, how we deal with it when it's there. That's my boy. So you've seen that it's all over the place. Eutrophication is uh, a big problem that we deal with around the planet. So how do we deal with this and try to fix it when it's there? Um, well, there are plants that can be implemented along the edges of farms, like mentioned before, that can start to suck up this nutrient, um, nitrogen phosphate nutrients. You've seen low, low dams and streams sometimes, and that actually aerates the water. It adds oxygen to the water, so that keeps this water oxygenated for the organisms living inside of it. As the algae is sucking it up, remember they're taking out a lot of that oxygen. When they bloom, they grow, they die, and they fall down, and they decay, and that process is pulling out a lot of the oxygen, killing the oxygen in there for other organisms. So by aerating it, we help that problem. Um, there's herbicides that can be used to kill the algae in these areas. Um, also, inter introducing biological controls. This is a touchy one. Things like tilapia in this picture will be eating algae, which is a good, a good thing, right? But by introducing an invasive species, you, you can cause a lot of um, knock-on effects. Obviously, one invasive species can suddenly eat the other um, an animal that we didn't expect. And we see this all over the world. There's tons and tons of examples. Uh, so you can throw off ecosystems this way too. You gotta be very careful with um, invasive species and biological controls. After the cleanup occurs or after this problem dissipates, one nice thing to consider is introducing native species that are there in the first place that can deal with these things and that have evolved to deal with these problems. So you fix the source problem and you fix the environment and you could potentially set back the clock into having a nice balanced ecosystem. Okay, and with that, I'll stop here. We've looked at ways to do some water testing and we've looked at ways to manage these problems. Um, like I said, it's a lot of information that I've thrown in this lesson. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that next year, 2021, we'll all be together so we can actually do a lot of these things with our hands in the lab because that's what counts. All right, see you later.